Welcome back. Well, I'm taking a little bit of a break from grass cutting, which is why I'm dressed like this, because I thought I would respond to one of the specific requests that I got when I asked, what kind of videos would you like? And this one is, it's timely and it's a safety issue, so I thought we'd run with it. When we come back, we are going to talk about scammers. See you in a minute. Okay, scammers. So, there are three kinds of scams I want to talk about today. And all three of these scams are particularly targeted at older people, older women specifically. And right now, because everybody's gotten their economic impact checks, you can be pretty well guaranteed that the scammers are out in force now. So, all right, here we go. Okay, Photo Bomb Kitty has left the building. Actually, he hasn't left the building. He hasn't even left the immediate area. He's three feet away from me on the floor. Okay, three kinds of scams. One is an internet-based scam. One is a telephone-based scam, and the third is a little of both. So let's start with the internet-based scam. Um, first of all, almost all the internet-based scams operate on the same general principle. Um, they used to call it the Nigerian Prince scam. Uh, and it's been around for a very long time, ever since the internet first emerged and people had email addresses because this is how the scammer gets in touch with their potential victims is through email. So you're minding your own business, you go on your computer and you look at your email and suddenly there's an email from, you know, uh, usually these days it's Ali Ben Hussan something or other. It used to be distinctly African names. It tends now to be distinctly Middle Eastern names because I suspect a lot of people have gotten wise to, you know, the Nigerian connection with this. Uh, oh, by the way, there's nothing against Nigerians. I'm sure the country of Nigeria is absolutely chock full of very honest, reputable people. And for all I know, the Nigerian princes involved in these scams weren't even from Nigeria to begin with. It's just that the name of that country has been associated with the scams. Um, a lot like the French pox being associated with venereal disease back in the Middle Ages. So you just never know what people are going to glom onto. So here's how the email goes. It's a very polite, respectful email, and it's, it's usually very long. They want you invested emotionally in this scam before they get you invested financially in the scam because the more time you put into it the more likely you are to continue putting time in it. So the email usually begins with some sort of story. The person who is writing it is uh, a government official, a banker, um, a lawyer in some foreign country. These days uh, the Middle East is common. Um, and they have somehow gotten their hot little hands on some money. Yes, dear, well, come on over and just don't sit there and wail. Did you hear that? He's getting very testy these days. They've gotten their hands on some money. But for some reason, they cannot remove the money from wherever it is. Um, either. It's in a strong box uh, where it's been left ever since the Iraqi war and they need the help of an American to get it out. Or it's the, um, the 
the life savings of someone who died without heirs, completely intestate, and the money is just sitting there in a bank account, and their quasi-criminal banking bosses are just going to steal the money, or their corrupt government is just going to take it and use it, you know, to recruit child soldiers. They'll, they'll, they'll try to get you into this, and they need your help. And they're going to assure you that there is nothing untoward and nothing illegal about this. Well, of course, everything about it is illegal. And whenever you see something like this, just remember, in the back of your head, you should be hearing, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Well, at Nigerian princes or Saudi bankers or um, uh, United Arab Emirate lawyers just dropping $10 million in your lap is too good to be true. So what do they want? As the scheme progresses, the first thing they're going to do is ask you for contact information. Now, of course, once you've read their email, you're going to throw it away, and that's where it stops for you. But for their average victim, no. You know, but you're not the average victim because you know now, dump that email, don't look back. What happens is as they draw you in, they start asking for your name, your address, your phone number, and then they start asking for your banking information. Now, they ask for your banking information because, after all, they have to transfer these millions and gazillions of dollars into your bank account. Or... Uh, and it's incredible that they say this, but they, they really do say this sometimes. They are going to give you a prepaid MasterCard, you know, with like $92 million on it. Now, at this point, the red light should be going off in anyone's head because prepaid MasterCards do not have gazillions of dollars on them and Nobody transfers money out of banks that way. They do it by wire transfers, and they have a whole protocol in place. The problem is that whole protocol is something the scammer can use to try to get your banking information, your account numbers, your routing numbers, and so on. Well, you're not going to give them any of this, because even giving them uh, just the information they want, never mind anything else, not even a, a, a lick of change. Just giving them your name, your address, your telephone number, your social security number, your bank account number, anything like that. This is information they can use. It's information they can sell. It can make you the victim of identity theft. It can, uh, it can really just rain chaos in your life if a criminal who is probably somewhere on the other side of the world has this much information. They can run around opening accounts in your name. Um, and most of the time, by the way, if they open accounts in your name, they the accounts will get shut down fairly quickly. But you never know. You know, they could get away with something. Don't give them the chance. Walk away. Now, their ultimate goal, of course, is not just to get your information. Ultimately, they will tell you, if you play with their scheme long enough, that they need some money for attorney's fees or to bribe the corrupt officials or whatever. And all of these scams are similar, but they all have their own little unique spin, you know, um, I, I need X number of dollars in order to bribe my boss or at the bank or, you know, the local government official or whatever. And it'll usually be, you know, two to three thousand dollars. And that's what their goal is. That's where the payday comes off for them when they can get you to give them that money. And they will get you to go to Western Union and send them a wire transfer to wherever it is they are. Sometimes, and oh, this is a, a new wrinkle, is they will ask you to go out and get prepaid cards, uh, gaming cards of all things, you know, Google Play or Apple Play or, you know, iTunes uh, music cards. And the reason for that is when you have the card, they will get you to give them 
the code number of the card, the Amazon gift card code number, for example. You give them the number, and then they can spend that like money, or they can sell it. And this is just win-win-win for them. So, um, that's where it goes if you play it out far enough. Unfortunately, some people have played it out even further than this and they've made trips to foreign countries where they have been kidnapped or worse. So always take this seriously. But remember, you shouldn't be scared. They've somehow come across an email address. They don't know who you are. They don't know where you live. You get rid of that email, just delete it, walk away, and they're never going to know. Now you may be saying to yourself, gee, Maybe I should just give this to the police. Maybe I should send this to the FBI. Maybe I should do something to stop these people, which is what a normal law-abiding person thinks. This is a crime. I should report it. Unfortunately, it does no good. There, there is no group of, of international law enforcement personnel who can do anything about this. As I said, the people are probably on the other side of the world. They may tell you they are from um, United Arab Emirates, and in fact, uh, th they could be from the Ukraine. There's no way of knowing, so don't worry about enforcement or putting them out of business. Just walk away. That's how you stay safe. And remember, your job is not to be the policeman of the universe. Your job is to make sure you don't get taken. Uh, so. That's where this, this goes, and that's our internet-based scheme. The telephone scheme, and mind you, this is just one of several, but this is the one that's pretty big these days, is the, uh, the internal revenue scheme. And it's not necessarily always the internal revenue. Sometimes it's someone calling saying, I'm from a courthouse. Um, they often will leave a message, you have to get back to me. And when you do, you talk to them and they say, well, you owe back taxes. We've done an audit on your account. Keep in mind, they won't know what, what your name is. They won't know your social security number. They won't have any of the other information the IRS has about you. But they will tell you they've done an audit. You owe back taxes, usually from several years ago. And... They're sending people to arrest you right now, and the only possible way you can avoid this is to make a payment. And you need to make a payment immediately. You need to do this to prove that it was just an accident, that you really wouldn't ever do this, even if you don't have all the thousands of dollars they want, just give them something, which of course you're going to give them, you know, with Google Play cards. I know. What does the IRS want with iTunes cards or whatever. The fact is, it's very easy for a panic-stricken person to believe that this is what they have to do because these people will yell at you, they will pressure you, they will say, you have to do this at once. Now, the IRS is one. Um, I got a call three days ago from, uh, and this was on my my landline that you know nobody ever calls me on saying that they had outstanding warrants for my arrest and i needed to call them at the courthouse they never said which courthouse they never said what the warrants were for um nothing so of course delete the message i walk away because it's the same thing they want money and they're hoping they can frighten you into making a knee-jerk response just giving them the money running out to the local store and grabbing that that gift card and reading them the information over the phone or going online and buying that amazon gift card and the Internal Revenue Service does not want an Amazon gift card. If you try to pay your taxes with an Amazon gift card, you just... Anybody who's thinking about doing this, please, before you do, 
just call the Real Internal Revenue Service and say, Sir, could I please pay my taxes with iTunes gift cards? Come on. But people do this. It happens. And it happens because people are panic-stricken and they're frightened. And older people are more vulnerable. And that's, that's us. We are older people. We are vulnerable. And I know not all of you are older. Some of you are younger. But remember, those of you who are younger, you have older parents. They are vulnerable too. So absolutely make sure they know about this. If somebody calls you and says, I am from the IRS, I am from the local police, I am from the courthouse, I am from whatever, and if you don't give me money right now, people will come to your house and arrest you. Goodbye. That is just not how the system works. You cannot buy your way out of an arrest. So, no. Let that one go. That's the sort of thing that just... If they catch you on the phone, you know, hang up, don't engage with them if you can avoid it. If they tell you they are from the Internal Revenue Service, hi, I'm from the Internal Revenue Service, ask them who they're calling for. It's that simple. Who did you want to speak with? They're either going to give you your name or they're not the Internal Revenue Service. Same thing with I am from the local courthouse. Who do you want to speak with? Your name or just hang up. Try not to engage with them. And the reason I say this is because the longer you engage with them, first of all, the greater the chance that they will be able to talk you into doing something, no matter how sure you are that you won't do it. But also because if they think they have a prospect your name will go on one of these scam lists and they share them with other scammers and the person who's scamming you on behalf of this mythical courthouse or the IRS today could be scamming you on behalf of a Nigerian prince tomorrow these people are criminals and you want to stay as far away from them as you can so let's talk about the third one and this one this one, I, I have to say, I believe this is the most dangerous because I have known reasonably intelligent people who have fallen victim to this. Um, I have not, well, I'm sorry, that's unkind. As I said, people who fall victim to this are not necessarily stupid. Sometimes they are panic stricken. Sometimes they are caught at a bad time. Um, so I take that back, that whole thing about reasonably intelligent people. Now, that was unkind of me. I have known people who have fallen victim to this. Um, usually, people can weed through the IRS scams. Like I say, at some point, they're going to say, give me an iTunes card, and you're going to say, you know, what is the IRS doing with that? This one is different, though. Um, Part telephone, part internet. Um, someone calls you and they say uh, you're entitled to a refund from your most recent Microsoft purchase. Well, you have a computer. Maybe you haven't purchased anything from Microsoft. Maybe you have a smartphone and you have some Microsoft apps on your smartphone. Maybe it's a rebate, maybe it's who knows, but they've got money for you, so you might listen. Also, um, I've heard that a new wrinkle on this one, although I haven't encountered it at all, is Comcast or CenturyLink, your cable service provider, because they do, in fact, very often give their customers rebates. So they will say, I have a rebate for you. And all you have to do to collect your rebate is go on your computer and fill out this online form. You go to your computer because we've all filled out online forms. Good heavens, even our doctor's office is making us do everything online. So we go on and we start, we go into the, the, the little URL box on Google and we start typing in. And we start typing in something 
that is going to bring us to a remote access program. It's called uh, Fast Support is one of the names. Um, there are a number of names for this particular program. It's a remote access program. It, now, it has a legitimate use. This is the program that people uh, handling technical support for computers will often use if they want to go onto your system and fix your problem for you. Personally, I don't use those programs under any circumstances, and as we go on, you will see why. You sign into that program and they've got control of your computer. They are on your computer, whether you realize it or not. They might then ask you to go to your bank account so that they can deposit the refund into your bank account. You go in. Now, they're not taking money out of your bank account. If they did, it would leave a trail. The bank could find it and law enforcement could find it. They're not that stupid. What they do is they put money into your checking account. The way they do this is they will take it out of your savings account and they'll just do a transfer. So let's say you have $5,000 in, in your checking account and $6,000 in your savings account. They put the rebate money in your checking account. They've taken it from savings. All they've done is a transfer. Now, you can't see that because they are doing this on a separate program once they've accessed your computer and your bank account. What you see is that refund they were going to give you that was allegedly two or three hundred dollars is suddenly four thousand dollars I, I made a mistake i'm sorry i was supposed to give you three hundred i've given you four thousand i gave you three thousand one hundred dollars more than i should have given you you need to give me back that money they never gave you a penny they took it from one of your accounts they put it in another account that's all they did but you're an honest person you're not trying to take anything from them so you're probably thinking, my God, I have to give them back $3,100. Now, naturally, you're going to have to do this with an Amazon gift card or, you know, an iTunes gift card or whatever. That, and that's, if you're involved this far, that's where it's going to go. That's how this scam goes. Now, there are other variations. Once someone gets you onto that remote access site, they can do anything they want to your computer. They can seize control of your computer and hold it for ransom. They can put viruses on your computer. They can go in and just muck about with your computer until they've made a colossal mess. Oh, you want your computer back? You've got to give them money. Which, of course, you must never do because even if you give them money, they're probably still not going to fix your computer for you. So, that is the most dangerous scheme You're in your computer. And they can get information, all kinds of information. When you signed into your bank account, they've probably picked up your user ID and your login information. They probably, they, they're probably mirroring your computer with a keystroke logger. No. So what do we know from this one? Never let anyone on your computer remotely. Never. Somebody says, well, go on and log on to this site. No. No. You get an email. There's a link. It says, go here, go there. No. You get an email from PayPal or your bank. You must check into your bank account. Use this link right away. Um, all kinds of activities are going on. We're shutting down your accounts. No. No. You just take those emails and you can send them to the bank or to PayPal if you want. Do not. Never give anyone any information. Uh, if they call you, they should know who you are. If they've called you and they don't know your name, 
hang up. That's it. Hang up. Goodbye. You get an email with a link in it saying, you need to go here, you need to go there. I don't care if it looks exactly like your bank. Um, I got one of those from PayPal once. I, I'm, I was certain it was not PayPal because they did not use my name. But I went through it and it took me 20 minutes to find the flaw. 20 minutes of going through that before I finally found out where they were really trying to send me with that link. Wow. And I knew it was a fake. Still, it took me 20 minutes to prove it. No. No information. Never click on a link. Never open an attachment. No, no, no. If somebody calls you on the phone and says, I want you to go online and go to this account and I'm just going to... I'm going to give you the information and you're going to type, you're going to hang up. That's all there is to it. No. So why is this time sensitive right now? Well, we all got checks from the government, those economic impact checks. And for a great many of us, you know, it's like, that's all well and good. My neighbor was telling me, it's like, yeah, I got a check. It's still sitting in my bank account because they won't let me go anywhere to spend it. Scammers know this. Are they going to be out in force looking for that money? Yes, they are. So remember, what you need to know to be safe is you don't know them, don't give them a lick of information, nothing. They send you an email, you don't know who they are, get rid of the email. If that email says there's a problem with this or that, throw it away. You want to know how to get in touch with PayPal? You go right into the notes on this video. I've got PayPal's phone number there for you. Go ahead and call them. You get an email that says it's coming from your bank. There's something wrong with your account. Go to go online. Go to your phone book. Look up your bank's phone number all by yourself. Call them up and ask them. Do not go anywhere that an email is sending you. No. Never log on to a remote site on your computer. And I know the problem with this is you're sitting back saying, how do I know if it's a remote site? Uh, especially since I've only been able to give you the name of one remote site. And I can guarantee you, there are people who can get you to that remote site by putting in candyland.com and send you there. Believe me, that technology is not hard. That is a fairly basic level of programming for these people. Sure, you just don't do it. Somebody calls you up and says, I want you to go on your computer, hang up the phone, walk away. If you don't know them, do not engage with them. And we have another issue coming up. It's 2020. It's a census year. And that means people are going to be coming around knocking on your doors. And they are going to say, we're from the census. Just remember, you do not have to open your door for anyone. Not, not even the police. The police knock on your door, you don't have to answer your door. If you have any concerns about the person on the other side of your door, don't answer. If somebody shows up and says, I'm from the census and starts waving ID in your face, you do not need to talk to them. Somebody shows up at your door and says, I'm from the gas company and waving ID in your face, there's a gas leak. You do not need to talk to them. If you have any concern, go right inside, close your door, you lock it, you stay safe. Remember, even though it is extremely unlikely that the person on the other side of your door is out to do you harm, I'm not trying to frighten you. Just remember the possibility always exists. Be careful. Always. The older you get, the greater your risk of harm. So, that's it for the scams for today. We are coming up to the end of our time, but we're not quite there yet. Word origins, I'm going to give you at least one quick one. 
entertaining to end on, and then I gotta go back out and cut grass. Ah, cravat. Once a Croatian. I did not know this. While this is the British word for necktie, the French are responsible for the term. In the 17th century, Croatian mercenaries appeared in France wearing linen scarves about their necks. The French, both men and women, were greatly taken with the idea. They immediately made scarves for themselves in linen and lace, and in muslin trimmed with lace, and tied them with long flowing ends. They began calling them cravats. Um, this was a perfectly natural thing to do, for the word cravats in French simply meant Croatian the race that had brought this new sartorial idea to France. I did not know. Alright, I have to go back out, cut grass. I will see you all, not tomorrow, because tomorrow is Thursday. I will see you all on Friday. Have a great couple of days, everyone. And I will be thinking about you while I am out doing yard work. See you all later.